respectfully coming our way over Skype. Um, we're, we are at 8 o'clock, which is when, when we are supposed to end, but I think we will uh, allow ourselves some time for uh, having questions from uh, from the audience to either the Dharma or Marcel. And I'm just going to open the floor for uh, short questions and not lectures, please. Anyone? Who has? Yes, please. Thank you, Rana and uh, Marcel. You might need a microphone also for Marcel uh, or not. Actually, my question is for Rana, but I'll say hi to Marcel. Hi, Marcel. Hi, Marcel. Sorry, uh, Rana, can you, because you mentioned that a couple of times, can you elaborate more why the regime was not uh, sharing IS? And it's not sharing uh, Kurdish territories too. I just felt curious to 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 see, to hear your perspective on this. And I think also it's worth explaining more about this. I see no one answer. Why don't you? Um, well, first in terms of ISIS, um, I, I'm not a. I'm, I'm not sure, and usually without evidence, I wouldn't say that the regime created ISIS. But there's certainly, that's something for sure, there is a convergence of interests and alliances. Um, I said that some of the people that, that the regime let go of prisons are now the ISIS leaders when the regime uh, did its reforms. And these people that the regime used to, the, the card in Iraq to destabilize Iraq and for its negotiations with the US, these were the fighters in, in, in Iraq coming back to Syria to be detained and to use when needed, and the revolution was when needed. Um, so, um, so yeah, since the beginning, uh, the regime had its own narrative, and it wanted to prove it to Syrians and to the international community that it's either us or the terrorists. Um, it came to admit, yes, we're bad, but the alternative is worse. Live with it. And everybody, many in Syria, I never, I mean, um, I never heard really people fully with the regime, even the ones who, who seem like totally loyal and w will be willing to kill for it, they will be, well, it's the best, it's bad, we know, but it's uh, the best of what we have. We have no alternatives again. So uh, the regime wanted to ensure no alternative is there. And by sharing cities and affecting all these factors, the ability of anybody uh, people to create, and by alternative, I don't speak about people, uh, I speak about a system, an alternative way rather than the regime three, yes, it will be shelled. Um, so that was, the, to assure there's no alternative. With the Kurdish issue, um, again, I don't know if the Kurds are cooperating with the regime or not, because I have no evidence, but what I can tell you about the trend is that certainly negotiations uh, are going on, and uh, for the regime, it seems to be that the Kurds are a card against Turkey. Um, uh, definitely the one thing uh, Turkey doesn't want, which is totally opposed to the regime, is the Kurds uh, taking their own autonomy because of the, its own Kurdish uh, population that it's uh, inflicting all kind of uh, hardships on them. So, so there are this kind of, uh, uh, again, uh, meeting of interests. So, uh, given the Kurds did not allow the Free Syrian Army to come to their areas, um, and the regime did not shell them, there were agree agreements going on. Now, again, agreements, um, the regime could have easily shelled uh, the Kurdish areas' cantons and uh, uh, like self um, self governed units. It's very clear to them where they are, and it's not doing that. So that's uh, to it. That's the other alternative. That it's maybe uh, the situation, circumstances change, things will change. But at the point, uh, yeah, I'm not sure like what's exactly happening with the Kurds and the regime. But for ISIS, this is uh, the case. Thank you. One more question there, please. Uh, well, it's, I think it's better for also for Marcel and Skype. Um, I have a question uh, about, well, maybe both of you can, can elaborate or explain it further, <clears throat> about the education in the liberated, liberated areas. 
So when I was there last year, they, um, they were issuing the baccalaureate, the first baccalaureate sort of uh, uh, diplomas, and they even had barcodes. And, uh, and I think it was two months ago, I read something that they were reopening the Aleppo University, which surprised me because I thought that the Aleppo University is actually in regime controlled uh, area. So could you uh, explain what's happening on that front in terms of uh, re-establishing higher education as well? I don't know if you have some more information on that, maybe Marcelo has. Okay. Yeah, I think the details, uh, Marcelo would have a, definitely a lot more information than me in this regard. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I did some research of uh, uh, the disintegration of uh, um, the educational system in Syria, and I was looking at how many curriculums we had in Syria. That was back in 2013. Back then, we had at least five. They were teaching the Libyan one. They tried to teach the Qatari ones. So, so because there are different ideologies, and people are trying to control children. If you control children, that's how you you create an entire ideology. So, this this uh, education is definitely one of the tools. Um, but in more details, what's happening in other I think Marcel is the person to go to. Marcel? Okay. Um, Aleppo, we, in the last scan we did in the liberated side of Aleppo, we have one, not 109 schools only for all, for all ages. From the 120 schools that doesn't teach the Syrian curriculum. And it doesn't teach the Syrian curriculum not only for ideological reasons, sometimes for the rumor itself that the Libyan degree is more effective now from the Syrian, that the Tilab degree is not, uh, the coalition degree is not enough and no one accepted internationally. So there is a lot of rumors regarding education. Till now, we can't give a degree that we are sure that someone will accept. Turkey legalized this year by year. Turkey is our main concern because most of the students from Aleppo, they finish baccalaureate and go to Turkey to study. They don't have a clear information. Each year they accept something, and the next year they deny that. So we don't have anything that regulates this process, unfortunately. And the coalition are trying. I don't know if they are trying enough, we like them. But I don't know also if they are supported in education to do enough. Uh, on the higher degree, like university, the Aleppo University in the regime side is open and didn't close. The problem is those who can't go to their university, we failed actually as a civil society and, and as a lot of people to address this problem. Many of the anger in the liberated areas of Aleppo among young towards other side is related to university. And we hear it a lot about the claims. They are going, they are finishing their studies while we are stuck here without anything. In our school, anyone who are above 15 is obsessed about weapons. Obsessed. They know each details about it, the name, the sound, the the price, and later on they will know where to buy it. And the choices to, to the out and deliberated areas are not, are not as many. Uh, so hopefully, I heard that one of the opposition, Basma Adman, are working on initiating a university in deliberated areas, but this project didn't see the light yet. So I don't know, really know if there is something soon. Thank you, Marcel, uh, for being on that. Are there any other questions or comments before we round up the meeting? Yes, please. I think that would make it easier also for Marcel to... Yeah, <laughs> My name is, uh, is Inge Berg, and I work for a Norwegian organization called Norwegian People Aid. We also have an office in Gaziantep. Um, I think at least we're one of those organizations aiming to not work with civil society as what Christian said in the beginning as a vehicle of delivery of services but rather work with civil society and see it also as um, political 
space um, and then sometimes we succeed and sometimes we fail which I guess at least there is a, is a conscious uh, decision of, of seeing um, civil society whether that means the delivery of education or support to more activist uh, initiatives as politics it's a very curious thing this thing that whereas we've just had election debates here in Norway where education and health of course is about politics and then you talk about other countries it's suddenly about um, saying how much it's not about politics, it's about delivery of services. So it's not a question as such, it's just a commendation of, of you and those of you, your uh, organizations and, and fellow activists, I guess. Um, and just to, to commend you and say, keep on doing what you're doing. And I think that it's important that those of us who are here in Norway, in Europe, in the States, in other, and have access to decision makers here, that you and those of us who do that can work together to also influence donors, international organizations to realize that civil society in countries like Syria have their own agency and that it's not just about not a non-political uh, non space. So thanks a lot. Other comments or questions from uh, the audience? Yes. It's a question about, um, as we learned today, uh, it started off as a, you know, people want freedom and democracy. Uh, I'm just wondering now, when you talk about the young guys on the back fence, uh, is the society also being radicalized, uh, as often happens in wars? Could you tell anything about uh, the feelings among young people on the ground? Uh, is it still freedom and democracy, or is it more the influence of that, you know, more radical and an extreme idea. Did you, did you hear that, Marcel? Yeah. Would you like to uh, elaborate a bit? You both we, we have all the range of things. And I can't really take the Bible from it to decide upon what people want now. Because when I was in there, I was close to be willing to hold weapon myself. There is anger, there is death, there is parts of body you see everywhere. And you seem isolated, especially when the borders are closed. If we like, we live, we are living with ourselves, our anger, our story. When main team decides that no one else cares. So yeah, a lot of young people now are moving towards hate. I don't know if it's affecting the state state, which is Islamic state or democratic state. Well, no one is seeing a state anymore. Syria, I really need to know it, for a lot of months has disappeared. So they don't know if we're going to go to election. Right now, if I will ask someone, who are you going to elect in the future? Their problem wasn't elect. Their problem is the future. The problem they can't consider that there is a future to consider. But hey, speak here. Yeah, there is a lot of hate speech. Uh, among almost everyone, those who are inside hate those who are outside, those who are in Turkey hate those going to Europe. Uh, we have a lot of levels of hate and anger. But I want to see if the violence stops. And we were being able to go back to speak among our our people about even forgiveness, even justice. I want to see what's going to happen. I consider myself one of the victims' families who really killed my mother, and I would love to start an initiative afterwards about regarding forgiveness. But right now, when I who who is going to forgive what we are keep, we are surviving. Right now. Yeah, I'm afraid I share your worry about the house, yeah. But we are the people who speak about democracy. We work in a little and no one still now, thank God, stopped us from working. It's not as easy as it used to be, and it's coming hard and harder every year. Of course the international community is pushing forward and saying there is no unified voice. I'm afraid that the unified voice in the future will be Al Qaeda. 
We will have 85 votes, but the children see as hard on it as we wish to the So the situation is growing, especially among the young themselves. There is no doubt in this, uh, and there is no going out. That's why a lot of them choose to this, this solution of going by sea to France to Europe, and others will choose like, we don't care what does this truck here in, in, this, in this country. And so I, I hopefully I answered your question because I went far away, came back, I'm sorry. Ronald, do you have some comments to that? I mean, I cannot answer it as holistically as uh, <laughs> Marcel does, but one additional comment on the, the, the means, uh, because Marcel, um, Mahmoud and Nathalie, as you have been on the ground a lot braver than me. I left Syria 2011, so at 12, end of 2012, and I, I, I'm not on the ground, but a lot of the information I tend to see is, again, too from social media, and what's happening is uh, people are getting caught in their own circles, so, and it's not, okay, it is mainly regime, anti-regime, and right at the beginning of the uprising, people start deleting each other, and even me, I, I felt into this trick. I couldn't stand people putting the, the photo of a dictator and I didn't want to see them on my homepage and I started deleting them. They couldn't stand my comments and they started deleting me. And what happened uh, actually is pro-regime and even now you have other differences too, like you have different Christian uh, Muslims, Alawites, you have all these you know, communities and they're starting to listen just to each other and they're like, Everyone on a, either extreme would have so many lives, and it's just increasing the system. Like, yeah, we're right because they totally excluded the other uh, uh, opinion, and this is just increasing the the gap and the fragmentation between uh, the groups. Thank you. Um, we were like uh, quarter past eight. I think we have. Uh, done what we can do today and there is still an, a film coming up later and um, this was a nice way of also commending space for organizing this because this is also what space is about is creating that room that is wider than the echo chamber that you described there Rana so thank you very much to you Marcel for being with us over Skype <laughs> Thanks to all of you who spent some time on a Friday evening on this important question. <laughs>